Hello and welcome to the EDH RecCast, where we're all about commander, data, and dad jokes. I'm Joey Schultz and I'm joined by my fantastic co-host. He's playing so many of those new bargain cards that he's practically a thrift store. It's Dana Roach, everybody. <laughs> Um, considering it's August, I thought it was super strange that I walked outside today and saw a snowman in the yard. I mean, it might've just been a puddle with a carrot in the middle, but like, I think it was a snowman. Oh, oh no. Oh, <laughs> f Frosty. It's kind of sad. What? It's, a little, it's a little sad, isn't it? <laughs> oh no. That's such a, I, f I feel so my... <laughs> that, that, that poor fella. Um, well, I, I hope he's... But you know what? Maybe we'll see him again in a couple of months. There we uh, go. When, when and, the winter comes around. <laughs> and I got three pieces of coal for free from my barbecue grill. So that's nice, too. Wow. Goodness. That's funny. All right. Well, Dana, it's the two of us on this show today. Matt yes. is taking a little bit of R&R &R for this one. But what are we talking about on this week's episode? We're going to talk about win more cards versus win con cards. Indeed, we are. Cards that help you to win more games versus cards that are, quote, win more. This should be a really interesting topic. It's one that our listeners have been requesting from us, actually, so I'm excited to get into it. But before we get there, we got some shout outs to do. First, I'd like to thank Chase, also known as Mana Curves, for helping editing the show. You can find them online at Mana Curves. We also wanted to let you know we'll be at the Magic Summit this year in Salt Lake City, October 26th to 29th. We had an absolute blast last year, and we hope to see you fine folks again this year. Come say hi and get in some games with us at the Magic Summit. And you may see us there in our Coalesce Apparel Magic-themed merch, which you can also get. And no matter what you get from Coalesce, use code EDHREC at checkout for 10% off your order. They have all types of way cool designs from the Omnath Rock and royal shirt to, of course, the EDH Rec collection, which you may see us sporting at the Magic Summit event. Once again, that's Coalesce and code EDH Rec for 10% off your order. You can also support the show by liking and subscribing on the YouTubes, and you can go to patreon.com slash EDH RecCast if you want to support the show that way as well. We've got a ton of really cool perks that are awesome, a private Discord for our patrons, for example, and of course, we've got our weekly patron shout out. And this episode, we'd like to dedicate to Jose Escoto. And if I may steal a pun from Matt when he saw the patron name, he said, thank you for Escotoing. <laughs> uh, patreon.com and supporting us there listen i don't make the dad jokes but it's his rule we have to honor matt's ridiculous puns for our patron shout out yeah. so there you go jose thank you so so much for supporting us i hope you like my butchering of matt's dad joke <laughs> no way jose liked that joke but wow oh that's even better <laughs> we appreciate his support regardless yeah good night okay Dana, let's just get into our main topic here. Um, win con versus win more. Win more is a term that I think a lot of players will know out there, but there are going to be plenty of people who don't know what win more means. So let's start with some basics here. What does, quote, win more mean to you when you're playing Magic? I kind of struggled with this because I found I use the term a couple different ways interchangeably. Um, mm. First of all, I, I tend to use it for cards that are kind of overkill. So, um, you know, something like gratuitous violence that would double the amount of damage that that sources you control deal to a person. Um, mm. You know, fairly recently we got fire emancipation that triples the damage. Um, you know, if we got a card that like quadrupled it or quintupled it or something, it's like that's probably win more. Like doubling the damage very frequently is enough to be a win condition and kill somebody. Tripling it definitely is. Once you scale that up even higher, it starts starts to become overkill. So I, that's one of the definitions I tend to have for it. Interesting. Um, but I, I found interchangeably, I often used one where the conditions that are required to make the card work are conditions that are already probably winning you the game. Yes. So I, I kind of use the use the term win more for both of those scenarios. Interesting. Okay. I I have some disagreement on your first idea there, and I, def I have a lot of agreement on your second point. For me, a win more card is definitely the kind of thing that provides value, especially providing minor value at a point where you're already ahead in the game. Like, it's not a card that's going to help you develop your board. It's not necessarily a card that's going to help you when you're behind either. In fact, it might be completely useless when you're behind. Um, 
The damage doublers, those are an interesting. I feel like, honestly, we might have a whole thing about cards that double things later on in the show because sure. th those are particularly tricky. Whereas, like, some classic examples for me that come to mind when I think of win more cards are, are things like Mighty Emergence, for example, which is not a very good card. It's like a three mana green enchantment, and whenever you get a five power creature uh, or greater in, into play, it puts two plus one counters on it. And it's like, cool thanks i already have a five power creature though i'm not sure if the two extra plus one counters were going to be the difference between me winning that game or not so those things didn't necessarily help or uh another one it was like stencia masquerade which i almost played in a vampire deck a long time ago whenever a vampire hits an opponent it gets a plus one counter on it and i'm like you know what in that card slot i could be using a much better effect instead maybe something that would protect my board of vampires or something that would have made them actually lethal instead of rewarding me when i was already doing pretty darn well and those types of cards don't do anything when you're way 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 behind so those cards are the ones that kind of feel win more to me yeah something like stentia masquerade i guess i can see an argument for it if you're playing in a deck where you're going wide with vampires like edgar markov decks and you tend to do but mighty emergence is a is is one of those cards where yes very much so like there's almost no situation where i can imagine where if you have creatures of that size on the board just putting a couple plus one counters on them is what's going to make a difference yeah like there's so many better things you can do with with that mana when you already have that kind of board state that's just very much a a, a win more card what it's doing is is going to not help you because you're already winning the game yeah <laughs> um, the, the example that's very similar that jumps out at me um there's an old card from back in judgment called epic struggle mm. and it's a it's kind of a cool alt win card i guess in theory it's an enchantment for two green green at the beginning of your upkeep, if you control 20 or more creatures, you win the game. But if you control 20 or more creatures, you better be winning the game anyway. Like, <laughs> what are the situations where that isn't already probably winning you the game? Um, you know, conceivably, I can see how that can happen, particularly in Commander where you have three opponents. But for the most part, nobody's playing, like, that many 1-1s or 0-1s without a way to kill people beyond just, like, sitting there and, like, getting the alt win. Um, yeah. So, so that 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 one is one of those cards that that whenever I've stumbled across it, because I, I think I have a copy in my binder here somewhere, I always look at it and go, "Oh, that would be good in that deck." And then I'm like, "But except it wouldn't, because I'm <laughs> if I have that many creatures, I'm just already winning." Yeah. Actually, speaking of creatures, that reminds me of two others that I've flirted with in my EDH deck building occasionally. Um, Visions of Glory and Nomad's Assembly are two others, and I'm like, oh, these read as really exciting effects. They're both white spells that will give you tokens equal to the number of creatures you already control. And I'm like, oh, this guy, I could make so many. And then I have to sit back and remember, wait a second, if I'm making 10 tokens off of this, that means I already have 10 things in play. And you right. know what I could do instead? <laughs> you know what I could do instead? I could play a Gold Goldmane. And then my board is lethal. <laughs> yes, right. I, 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 I could play an Akroma's Will. And then I am going over the top. Like, that is the thing that makes this conversation, I think, especially valuable, is knowing that like once you've recognized, oh, this kind of card is really only doing well when I'm already ahead you realize like what is it that you actually need when you're in a winning position well what you need are the overwhelming stampede or chroma's will type of cards that do push you to like oh this actually closes the game down or you need like a heroic intervention or counter spells of some kind to protect the board and preserve what you've already got rather than something that is like you get rewarded with even more stuff for your stuff yeah yeah in a lot of these situations what you want is not a card that makes your already winning board state win more. What you want is a card that can turn your board state that isn't already a winning board state into one that is. Yeah. And I think that is what the definition, like what that we're looking at here between a win more card and a card that wins the game. And, and you mentioned overrun or even like a crater hoop behemoth or something. You know, if, if, if you're looking at epic struggle, epic struggle is taking your already winning board state and letting you win with it. <laughs> An overrun effect like Crater Hoof or something is taking a board type that isn't already winning you the game and turning it into one that does win you the game. Yes. So you yeah. it, it it is what pushes you to the point where you can win versus a card that's taking an already uh, state that you should be winning with and just letting you win with it.
Yeah. And I know that Matt had some examples that he's encountered uh, that he wanted to put into the show as well. For example, he's got a Kyler deck, which pumps up all of your humans for each counter that's on Kyler, and it gets more counters whenever you play humans. And like we've seen in the data on EDH rec that some people play Anthem effects in their Kyler deck. And he's like, no, like you don't need it. Kyler already gives your entire board like plus seven, plus seven or plus 10, plus 10. So playing more Anthems, you don't need that level of redundancy in that deck necessarily because it would just be redundant. What you need instead are ways to protect Kyler to make sure that your board stays big. I know there are a lot of folks who also argue that like Crucible of Fire in a dragon deck, giving all of your dragons plus three plus three, they feel like the dragons are already big enough that you don't need that extra bonus. It's not necessarily going to push you over the top. That one might be in contention. Some people might like it. Some people don't. I've certainly seen the argument both ways. Or... Speaking of dragons, Minion of the Mighty is another that might be classified in this one as well. That's the one mana kobold, the zero one, and it has this pack tactics ability. Whenever it attacks, if you attacked with creatures that have a total power of six or greater this combat, you get to put a dragon creature from your hand onto the battlefield tapped and attacking for free. And that sounds really enticing, for sure. It also might be overkill. It might not be the thing you need in that situation. If this card is good, you've already got some big creatures in play mm -hmm. to cheat another big creatures in play, which means you're probably in the late game already, and this might not be the thing you need in that moment. So potentially that could also count in this category for some players. Um, another big one that stands out for me is like Endless Ranks of the Dead, <laughs> which gives you half as many zombies as you already control on your upkeep. And again, it's like the, the assembly cards that I mentioned earlier. I'm like, I need a board for these to do anything. And what I'm getting isn't something that pushes me over the top. What I'm getting is actually kind of a minor amount of value in the grand scheme of things. Well, and that's actually a really good point talking about like talking about the, the, the crucible of the fire in a dragon decks, for example that is often going to feel like a win more card if, if your dragon deck is filled with, you know, six and seven drop dragons. Lathless Dragon Queen decks, however, when I've seen them in, in, out in the wild, a lot of times those decks run some pretty bad dragons. Mm. Um, like the, 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 you know, the couple of the two and three drop kind of dragon whelp cards because the goal oftentimes is to play those to get Lathless to trigger to make you the six drop, the, the six, six dragon. And then you like blink or bounce to recast those small cheap dragons again to make more big ones. Yeah. In that situation, being able to buff those small dragons that you have out might be worthwhile. So I, I guess the, the, the point I'm making here is a card being a win condition versus win more isn't necessarily a binary state. A card isn't always either win more or a win condition. It just probably depends on your play style, your deck, your meta. There's still, the situations are going to change. Crucible of Fire, if you are, you know, just casting like giant Ur Dragon style dragons that you're cheating into play, it probably doesn't do you any good. Yeah. If you are playing a bunch of small dragons, it might be much more effective. Stencia Masquerade that you mentioned. If you are playing a bunch of small vampires, it's a much better card than it is if you're playing a bunch of, you know, giant haymaker, legendary four and five drops. Mm -hmm. um, so that is something like like the the what is a win con versus win more is probably relatively fluid in a lot of situations as well. Definitely a really good point to bring up there. Yeah, is that these can be so context and deck dependent. Uh, a card that uh, Matt and I had a bit of a laugh about uh, in a previous episode was Lux Artillery, which if you have, uh, I think it's like 20 or more counters among permanents you control, uh, then Lux Artillery will deal 10 damage to each opponent for you. And Matt and I both were like, oh, this is such a, a fun, exciting looking card. But if we have 20 or more counters on our stuff, we're, we're probably already sitting pretty. We're probably already doing pretty well. And that is hitting into that overkill thing that you mentioned. But that's only the case for the two of us and the plus one counters that we have. You have Lux Artillery in a different deck and you use it to great effect in a way that doesn't feel win more. It does feel just deeply relevant to the game. Yeah, I, I, I'm playing it in a, a modular deck. Um, and a lot of the creatures in that deck are quite bad. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm not running like really good creatures with plus one counter G synergy. I'm running bad creatures that happen to have modular. So the ability to put an extra two plus one counters on all of them with Lux Artillery is really, really useful. And maybe I'll occasionally get lucky and hit the threshold to actually deal damage to people. But if I don't, it's just a useful card in that particular deck. And that makes a good comparison to to the um, Mighty Emergence card we talked about before that also, you know, my deck was a two-color deck, so I'm putting two counters on. Mighty Emergence puts two counters on things too, 
but two counters are much more valuable in that modular deck where my creatures are are small and kind of bad and right. the count the counters get moved around and I can stack them on something versus that mighty emergence where you're just putting them on an already large body and probably doesn't as doesn't doesn't give you very much ahead. Yeah, yeah. Green does not need oh two plus one. Green's got so many ways to pump stuff up. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. Whereas a Boros modular deck has way less options. Yeah, yeah. So, and the way that those uh, those things compound, the way that you're moving those counters around, that also becomes a lot more relevant too. So, like that's a, a really good thing to point out for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, I know another example. Uh, sort of on the on the flip side that we had was also like discussion of uh, Atempsis, which for you has felt like a win more card, but for me has felt like a win condition card. Sure. Um, Atempsis is the basically the Exodia Obliterate Sphinx, where when it hits you, you can reveal cards in your hand, and if you have six different mana values amongst those cards, uh, then you're, the person that Atempsis hit will just lose the game outright. I have a mono blue deck where my win conditions feel a little bit thin. Um, I t it's my Elegith deck, the Scry Sphinx, where every time I would scry instead, I draw a whole bunch of cards. So I have some win conditions in there like Psychosis Crawler, but Atempsis really feels necessary because, I, I mean, Blue has the has the tendency to not win games in a speedy fashion, and I crave a way to win a game in a speedy fashion. Sure. Um, but that So that's been a good one for me in that deck, whereas for you, you've got a Sphinx deck where you're like, I do not need what Atempsis is serving actually at all, it turns out. Yeah, and I've killed people with Atempsis on that alt-win condition, but it's just an accident. <laughs> it's because I, I have Atempsis out, and I've got 11 cards in hand, and I'm like, okay, well, I guess... Oh, I guess I can I can just focus all my damage on this person because Atempsis can take this person out, um, just accidentally, you know. So <laughs> like it's it's because I have w access to white, so I have you know your Acroma's wills and your true convictions, and so like right. I have other ways to interface with that combat damage step and make those big flying evasive sphinxes much more useful than your deck probably does in mono blue. Yes. Um, yeah. So for me, it, it winds up being very much a win more effect, whereas you're probably thrilled to see a Tempsis because you're like, oh, well, it's, it's one person now I can feel like I can take out yeah. that I wasn't sure I could take out before. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That That's such a good point. Like you are, by the time, if you are playing that Sphinx deck and you've got enough Sphinxes in play with their double strikey lifelink true conviction-y stuff going on mm. and you're slamming into people and you have like 11 plus cards in hand, you're already sitting pretty you don't yeah, need a right, yes. to do what you need are the counter spells to defend that position or the acroma's will to put you over the top that kind of thing right so like that totally makes sense and so that's why again these win more versus win condition cards it is going to be very context dependent although talking about sphinxes that does make me think of one that i think regardless of context uh, is just a win more card, and that's Ormos Archive Keeper. <laughs> right. I remember we had a pretty good laugh about this card when we saw it. That's the Sphinx that says if you would draw a card while your library is empty, instead you put five plus one counters onto Ormos Archive Keeper, and it also has this ability of like discard three cards of different names to draw five cards. That that engine can be cool, but if you are ever putting plus one counters onto Ormos Archive Keeper. That means you've done something already so way right that a slowly increasing in power Sphinx probably isn't the most relevant thing for your current position. <laughs> yeah, it, it's one of those things like if you are accident accidentally getting to that point, uh, I don't know how you are not already in a position to win. And if you're intention, <laughs> if you're intentionally getting to that point and doing something to empty out your library, then there's way better ways. <laughs> there's like four or five different ways that utilize that alt win condition that are all much much better than Ormos that you should be running versus just hoping the sphinx can 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 connect to somebody for lethal damage <laughs> yeah very much yeah it's 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 very much the walk uphill both ways of thassa's oracle <laughs> like if, i mean maybe if you really want to to get that thassa's oracle win the hardest way possible it's it's a thing and i'm, I'm not going to tell you not to do that but it definitely feels like a win more card the vast majority of the time. You don't need to do it yeah. or it's 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 giving you something that in a, you're in a situation where you probably already won the game. Right. Like, and I don't want to win with a Thassa's Oracle. That's not personally my vibe. But I, I also don't want to win with an Ormos. Like, that's just that's also not my vibe because I'm just like, you're asking for me to do stuff. Either I have everything in my hand already, at which point I, I should be able to probably win somehow if I'm drawing that many cards or I've milled myself completely, at which point. I don't know. I'll play a reanimation spell or something. I'm sure. just like I don't. I don't. I don't need what you're serving specifically. Um, one thing we sometimes see Watsy do, and I guess this this probably falls into that win more category as well, is when they put an effect on a card that 
probably isn't necessary. And the one that jumps out to me is giving Grave Titan Death Touch. Um, and there's <laughs> sure. a handful of cards in black and green that do that, where like anything blocking Grave Titan is probably dying. It's a 6-6 six, six that's making you a bunch of zombies. Yeah. Does, d- does giving that creature Death Touch matter? I mean, on occasion, of course it does, but like... 95% of the time that's that that text is just redundant and it's on there in a way it's kind of made that card win more in its own way. Um recently we got Icker Moon Gauntlet. Mm. It's a really really good card from Frexia All V1. Mm-hmm. Um but all it needs to say basically is whenever you cast a non-creature spell, choose a counter on target permanent and put an additional counter of that kind on that permanent. Like if you're playing a, a Super Friends deck, just the ability to add more loyalty counters like that whenever you cast a non-creature spell is ridiculous. The fact that it has additional text on there, it gives your Planeswalkers the ability to proliferate for zero. And especially the minus 12, take an extra turn after this one. If you are in a position to have a bunch of Planeswalkers that have 12 loyalty on them, <laughs> you better be winning the game already, right? Like, <laughs> right? Like yeah. you, you absolutely should be in a position to just take that game over. Um, so it, it, in a lot of ways, like that, that's a win more card. Although I think in some of these cases, maybe design knows that and they're just putting these win more conditions on cards, whether it's death touch on a giant body or or that minus 12 on Ikerman Gauntlet, mm-hmm. just because they know it's kind of unnecessary, but it looks cool. Yeah, yeah, very much. I know Matt's also big on the Ikerman Gauntlet. He's just like, do you know how hard it is to defend that many Planeswalkers where these abilities would be relevant? Mm-hmm. Like, that that's pretty hard. But like the, yeah, that doesn't mean that the cards themselves are useless. It's just that like there are some, t- trinket text is I, I think maybe what it's called. Of like, yes, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's just like, oh, this, this card has flavor text and it's rules text is kind of how it feels a little bit sometimes. Right. <laughs> Um, those are very interesting examples. I, I'm also kind of interested in another subset of this, of like the the cards that, and I know this is something that Dana, you're you're big on as well. Like cards that by the time that you can cast them, you kind of don't need them anymore. And mm-hmm. I think that that's also sort of a subset of win more cards in some ways. Yeah, definitely. And, and you know what? I, I guess the argument can be made that that's just a poorly costed card. Hmm. But th- those, but like those things can be simultaneously true. A card can be, you know, perhaps have a cost that you feel too is too expensive. But like that's what makes it win more. By the time you get to that point, grave betrayal is one that I always always jumps out at me. I always want to want to run grave betrayal. It's a card that it's a, it's a seven man enchantment, um, five black black, and whenever a creature is put into opponent's graveyard you gain control of it basically back into play with a plus one counter on it, which also feels a little bit unnecessary. <laughs> um, but it's a su- that's a super cool effect. Anything you kill, you gain control of. Except for by the time you get to the point in the game where you have the ability to play a seven mana enchantment and you're killing your <laughs> opponent's creatures, you're probably doing okay without needing that grave betrayal. Yeah, no, yeah. and and that's a I've I've used that one in the past, and I do all, I I love that card. It just feels like such a classic. Super, yes, yeah, it's a, a quintessential commander type of card to me. But I also totally get that I'm like, yeah, if I'm if I'm doing stuff that would make this card really good, I there are probably other things I could have done that are a bit more efficient, or better yet, a bit more reliable to help me from when I'm like not in a winning position. Uh, so like it is. Yeah, that, that one's up there. A, a big example for me in, in this type of category would be Cultivator Colossus, which is the, the seven mana green plant beast. Um, and it has this effect of like when it enters the battlefield, you can pl- put a land from your hand onto the battlefield tapped. And if you do, you draw a card and you can repeat this process. So you can put all the lands in your hand onto the battlefield. And I'm like, this is a seven mana card. Like, yeah, I, I think we're already doing pretty OK uh, if, if we are paying seven mana for this, having a lot of lands in our hand. It takes a very specific type of circumstance to make sure that that will actually have as big of a payoff as it first reads that it that it will have mm-hmm. um so like that that's another uh big example of, of that type of category to me or um actually another one that comes to my mind is uh as a root channeler in life gain decks uh which can like tap to gain you life and it reduces the cost of your spells for each life that you've gained that turn and that's a really cool effect and if you can harness it I, it can do some really big things for you for sure but it is a six mana creature that is giving you more mana and that is a circumstance that you have to engage with pretty critically because getting even more mana when you paid six mana for this thing that will accelerate your mana, that's a little bit tough. It's a tough sell in a lot of places. Yeah. Uh, Death's Presence is one that leaps out at me. Mm. Uh, Five and a green, another enchantment. Whenever a creature you control dies, put X plus one counters on target creature you control where X is the power of the creature that died. 
Um, so if you know you're playing some kind of a say a dragon deck, for example, and you have access to green, someone kills one of your big dragons. You Put a bunch of counters on another big dragon. That seems fantastic. But if you've got a mul- multiple big dragons out, you're probably doing okay already without yeah. that being your backup plan. And if you want a backup plan to continue to like dominate the board with multiple dragons, there's better ways to do it than having one of them die to buff the other one. Yeah. And that's not to say there aren't decks where like you're sacrificing stuff. And and, and I I absolutely believe that Death's Presence probably has a has a place in some deck where you're doing really cool things with it. But like by and large, it feels like a win more card whenever I've tried to run it. I I say this as a man with a Rayhan Last of the Odds on deck, which has a similar ability. When your stuff dies, you can put its counter somewhere else. I don't play Death's Presence in that deck, yeah. even though it has nearly the same ability. Sure. Because the difference of three mana is really big. It's it's a really, really big deal. And by the time that I get to the point of having six mana and I have a lot of counters that I want to move around, well, preserving them feels like a really important thing. And like making sure that I have creatures in the first place is a really important thing. And simply doubling my counters, that there are some ways where that can be really good, but doubling them in this way is tough when my commander is already doing that. It's a level of redundancy that I don't always feel that I've I've needed. So mm-hmm. like, yeah, I'm playing a deck where the commander is literally like, hey, this is text that, I'm, that I clearly quite like. And even then I'm just like, yeah, I, I don't know if I would play that. Um, and in that same deck, another uh, win more card that I've kind of flirted around with here and there is Ascendant Acolyte, which enters with plus one counters on it, equal to the number of counters that you already control. And each turn it doubles its own counters. And that's very exciting. But again, at that mana, I'm like, if I already have a lot of counters, I don't think I need a thing that just gets a j- that just gets bigger. I think what I need is something else. When I have a lot of counters, I need to manipulate them in a different way. So that's another card that also in the plus one counter vein starts to feel a little bit like that overkill, a little bit like you know this card slot could be dedicated to something that protects me instead of something that makes my already good board a little bit better. Yeah, you, you want to find the thing that pushes you to the win, not the thing that takes the win and makes it still be a win basically <laughs> yeah yeah yeah, yeah. and, and exactly. it, it, one of the things that's tricky like it, it can be challenging to tell those two apart but no. not as challenging as the stats d- we're d- about d- to you, take a you, look at d- I, I was an <laughs> inch away dana uh, i can tell i'm watching the clock i'm like oh, okay i'll let it go too long at this point he's gonna jump in i was gonna be like you know what we haven't done yet dana <laughs> d- cry out loud all right fine i don't get to have segues into challenge the stats but that's okay i am a mature adult who can handle it <laughs> um <laughs> Yes, there's a lot of data on Ideatrek that we don't always agree with, so we'll challenge some stats after a quick break. Dang it, Dana! (laughs) Hey, do your wireless bills keep increasing? The answer is probably yes. Let's just be honest. Sudden charges, unexpected overages, the full works. But did you know that for a limited time, wireless plans with Mint Mobile are just 15 bucks a month? That's unlimited talk, text, and data for just $15 a month. All plans with Mint Mobile come with unlimited talk and text and high-speed data delivered on the nation's largest 5G network. And what I love most is that you can use your own phone with any Mint Mobile plan and keep your existing number and existing contacts. Which... Just thank goodness, right? Trying to redo all of that would be such a pain. And Mint Mobile is there to make it easy for you. To get your new unlimited wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month and get the plan shipped to your door for free, go to mintmobile.com slash EDH. That's mintmobile.com slash EDH. Cut your wireless bill to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash EDH. All right, I'm going to start us off with Challenge the Stats this week, and this is our listener challenge coming to us from William Lyons, who has a really clever pick for Urza Chief Artificer decks. Urza Chief Artificer is the Esper Urza that makes those uh, construct tokens on each of your end steps, and those constructs get bigger for each artifact that you control. And specifically, William wanted to point out that the card Ruthless Technomancer seems like it actually has a pretty darn good home in this deck. This is a card that I've actually struggled to find a good home for so William I really like that you found a great home for it here Ruthless Technomancer is a four mana human wizard from one of the Kamigawa sets I believe and uh, when it enters the battlefield you may sacrifice another creature you control if you do you create a number of treasure tokens equal to that creature's power and it also has another sacrifice ability that can help you get some stuff back but it's a little bit tricky the main point here is that Ruthless Technomancer coming in and sacrificing one of Urza's construct tokens will make 
a lot of treasures for you. And those treasure tokens are all artifacts that will then buff up all of your other construct tokens. So this is kind of a perfect home for Urza's constructs to get even bigger. They're, I mean, those constructs, if you've ever played against an Urza deck, they're just huge already, so you can make a whole lot of mana off of this. And maybe those treasure tokens are something that you'll take advantage of with a Marionette Master or with a Cyber Drive Awakener, which like a third of Urza players are using in that deck as well. There are a lot of really cool directions for this. William, I totally agree. Ruthless Technomancer is a cool piece of tech for an Urza deck, and it's showing up in less than 100 of the 6,600 Urza decks out there right now. So folks, if you're playing Esper Urza, give this one a look. This is some really, really cool tech, Nomancer. <laughs> yep, thank you very much for that suggestion, William. Um, mine this week uh, is the card Sage of Fables. Sage of Fables is a merfolk for two and blue, and it says each other wizard creature you control enters the battlefield with an additional plus one counter on it, and you can spend two mana to remove a plus one counter from a creature you control and draw a card. Sage of Fables is currently in um, about 40% of Marchesa of the Black Rose decks, and the reason it's in so many Marchesa decks is because one of the things Marchesa does is whenever a creature you control with a plus one counter on it dies, you return that card to the battlefield under your control at the beginning of the next end step. Marchesa is a wizard, so when she comes into play, Sage of Fables immediately puts that plus one counter on her or any other wizards you control, and they automatically now have that recursion baked into them. Mm. Zelix Sanity Flare is a mono blue commander with the background ability, um, and it's the most common commander paired with the Haunted One background that gives creatures you control undying. Um, Sage of Fables is only in three Zelix and Haunted One decks, and it should be in way more, kind of for the opposite reason as Marchesa, hmm. because when one of your creatures dies, as long as Haunted One is out, it comes back into play the plus one counter on it, which then would keep undying from triggering. You can, you can use Sage of Fables to remove those counters and draw a card at the same time. <laughs> that is a really, really useful synergy in that deck, kind of for the same reason it's useful in Marchesa, just from the other direction. You want it in Marchesa, so she always has a counter and is always coming back. In this case, you want it in your Zelix deck, or basically any blue commander paired up with Haunted One, so you can continuously remove those counters and keep it coming back. Um, if you are playing basically anything with access to blue and running Haunted One uh, in, as, as your background, take a long look at Sage of Fables. It is really, really useful and should be in more than three Zelix decks or whatever blue commander you have paired up with Haunted One. That is so clever. Because, yeah, my eyes, when I look at Sage of Fables, my eyes go right to the wizard text. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't, like, you can remove plus one counters from any creature you control. It doesn't have to just be dedicated to wizards. So Yes. Yep. Okay, wait, Dana, I have, are you, is this like tech that you're, that you're on about because you're using it in an upcoming deck? Is, am I, I, I'm getting that sense from you right now. This is the thing that I may have been using in a deck recently. Uh, if you want to tune, okay. we'll, <laughs> tune in when we're back streaming uh, first Wednesday of September, I will probably be busting out <laughs> um, my, my Veil, Candle, Keep Sage, and Haunted One deck. And, and hopefully I will get out Sage of Fables very early um, and no one else will want to see that. But uh, it's yeah, an excellent no. card and you should run it in those decks for sure. Yeah, ways to mitigate the undying. That is very, very clever. Cool stuff. Let's get back to our main topic here now. Um, Dana, earlier you had mentioned some effects that double things. Your example was gratuitous violence, which you were like, gratuitous? Yeah, I think I agree with that term sometimes. <laughs> um, I'm, I am I told you that I was a little bit iffy on some of the doublers, and I'd actually, I think like the, the cards that double effects might be one of the trickiest things to talk about when it comes to win condition versus win more. So like doubling cube, doubling your mana, or even Nyx Bloom Ancient, tripling your mana, or any token doubler like a Parallel Lives. A lot of those, I think, can simultaneously fall into both of these categories. And I think that's one of the things that trips us up the most. Like when I see a parallel lives or a doubling season, you're 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 darn right I'm afraid of those because doubling stuff is a way to go over the top to make sure that your opponents cannot deal with everything that you're doing. But also I do have a couple of decks where I'm like, I actually don't think I need like a Parallel Lives. Like I took Parallel Lives out of my Titania Protector of Argoth deck because it turned out that once I got that engine going, the amount of damage I could do with the elementals that that deck makes, I didn't need to produce double of them. It, it That actually was overkill. 
So like the, these doubling cards are, I think, very, very tricky because I think they can be both the thing that makes you win more and they can sometimes be win more. And that makes them so wild. No, a, a, a tricky is exactly the right word because um, I've totally been in the same situation where I've, I've had those decks where I feel like Parallel Eyes and Doubling Season never quite like accomplish what I want them to accomplish. Either the, the situation where like the impact is too minimal for what I have to do. I've just played doubling season and then, you know, it took up a, most of my turn because it was six mana or five mana and I, I couldn't, you know, do anything super powerful. So I'd make, make one token, which turns into two. Mm. That feels underwhelming. Or either a situation where like I'm going to make, you know, eight tokens and now it's 16. But making eight tokens is pretty good, right? Like, there's a lot of times, like, that's probably going to be enough in most situations. Obviously, not always. Like, I, I still run doubling season in a couple decks. We joked about it a few weeks ago, how, like, I didn't want to have to pick up one for the the fourth iteration of Glissa, the the, right. the incubate deck I was going to make. Um, I'm going to try, try it out in that deck for sure. Um, but absolutely, I've completely run into a situation where, like, I feel like it's it's enough. The effect number one is so scary that that like people don't want you to leave it in play. Mm -hmm. um, but number two, when you can utilize it most effectively, it's a situation where like oh, sometimes you just don't need it. Yeah, and and I think that's why I find like some of these examples feel a little bit cleaner to me. But some of them, like the damage ones that you mentioned, like I've I've seen fire emancipation tripling the damage you do. That completely transforms a person's board into like, oh, clearly this is one of their win conditions. Yeah. And even if they had that and the gratuitous violence in play, it'd be like, oh yeah, you send a one one at me, and I'm still taking so much damage that it's just like I need to be terrified of you. So those don't feel like overkill to me. Because sometimes they do just establish the ability to do a kill. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so that's why I tend to be, when we were talking about definitions of win more earlier, overkill isn't usually a piece of my definition of win more. And yet I do find myself in some other circumstances. Like I don't play Nyx Bloom Ancient in, in any of my decks because the, by the time that I would be able to play a Nyx Bloom Ancient, I don't need all that much mana. Like I've joked before about, oh, I hit a bucket list item of I write of replication to Nyx Bloom Ancient and now all my lands tap for 243 mana. And that was certainly me living the high life. But it was also like I did. There's not a lot I could. I didn't need all of that. Like that right. was, it yeah. was a, a hilarious jape of an EDH moment, but also was like very unnecessary. Um, and, and so like there are some of these that in certain categories, they, they fit one way or the other. And I, I think this probably just comes down to. It again depends on the deck that you're playing, yeah. whether or not these cards will be considered overkill or whether they'll be considered necessary. Yeah, I, I think the difference, at least for me, winds up being how long it takes for them to be effective. Hmm. And you're talking about like Nyx Bloom Ancient or or even the Parallel Lives Doubling Season Anointed Procession kind of cards. You have to expend some amount of mana to play them, which then cuts into your ability to do the doubling thing, whether it's doubling the mana off Nyx Bloom Ancient or, or doubling the tokens that you're making. Whereas something like Fire Emancipation or Gratuitous Violence, yes, you've spent X amount of mana that turn, but like that's just immediately doubling how much damage that 6-6 six, six Dragon you have deals. Mm. So, so in those cases, I think the damage doublers is much easier to um, use as a win condition because the things that you're going to be using to take advantage of that might already be present, whereas for the most part, you're going to need to have resources available to make tokens, or you're going to need to have lands untapped to take advantage of Nick Blue Mansion. Um, and that's why I think it makes them feel win more, because if you're in a position to play those cards and wait the full turn to take advantage of them, and then maybe wait another turn to to execute your game plan, um, you've probably been in a pretty solid position already mm -hmm. versus something like dropping that gratuitous violence or fire emancipation can turn that board state from one that wasn't a winning board state to one that just immediately is. Gotcha. Yeah, that that really that makes a lot of sense. The timing on that is a, a, a good qualifier to use for sure. Mm -hmm. um, also sort of in this vein, what do you think of like spark double or things that make that you can use to make copies of your commander? Uh, would that qualify, do you think? Or uh, I, I, I would hesitate to because like having two copies of a commander, that's pretty darn neat. <laughs> um, but it does require you to like be able to keep your commander around <laughs> in order to copy it. And that you're already asking a lot from the rest of the board if they're going to let you keep your commander around right, in the first right. place. So where do you fall on, on those types of things? I, I always just feel like those are just so universally useful. Like if your commander is worth running, it's worth running two of them almost exclusively every <laughs> single sure. time. Um, okay. you know, yeah, there's exceptions on occasion. But like 
So there's just you know, like I, I think Spark Devil is just never a wrong choice in any deck. It's pretty hard to screw up. Hmm. Um, I, I don't feel like it's necessarily a win condition so much as it is like it's just a amazing card in almost every situation. Yeah, yeah, that that makes sense because because especially like the amount of effort that it's asking you to go through is uh, like yeah, it can be a tall order to keep your commander around, but not in every game necessarily. There are some commanders that it's just like oh, I'm pretty sure I can get away with keeping this around for a turn. Not everyone is playing Sir Conrad Joey right, <laughs> that, right. that draws all of the attention from the game. Um, but especially I think it's the, a, a big component of the the win more idea versus the win condition idea is like very much about the distance between how much effort it takes to make this card work and how big or relevant the payoff is that it is going to grant you having your commander in play and playing a spark double that's not the most that, that doesn't take all of the effort in the world or um you know to quote one of matt's favorite cards here rishkar's expertise or last march of the ents uh which he has yet to actually resolve which is a fun <laughs> thing because so far when he's played it it's been narset's reversal which i'm sure oh, he's very very happy yeah, about right. one of the only counter spells that actually makes it so that he that it gets around the can't be countered clause on on last march um but like those are also cards that require you to be in some amount of a, a board position but the thing for me is that they are still relevant even if you are not necessarily winning the game already. Like you could have just a 3-3 token that someone gave you with a generous gift and a rich card's expertise is still going to be pretty decent. Draw three cards, play something for free. And the, the payoff there is pretty good. The value that it's giving is pretty good. And the thing that it asked of you also wasn't too egregious compared to some of the other things that we mentioned, where it's just like, you need to have X many five fives in play in order to get a couple of counters or draw a card or something like that. So like that variance between what the payoff is and how much effort it took, that is really, I think, the one of the things that I find myself fixating on. Yeah, and we talked in the, in the first half of the show about like, you know, it's going to depend on your deck and your situation and maybe even your personal play style, whether a card is, you know, win more or a win condition. Um, and like sometimes in, in kind of real time, I've realized that. Um, Throne of the God Pharaoh is a card I, I remember when it was first previewed. Um, deals damage at the end of the turn for each tapped creature you control. And I remember being like, well, if you were swinging with enough creatures and you're tapping that many creatures for it to do damage, uh, a significant amount of damage, well, you just don't need it. Like, you just, just run an anthem or something and have those creatures hit even harder. Sure. <laughs> um, it, it, it seemed redundant to me. Um, until, like, I, I was playing a little bit uh, after it had been out for a while, and I was, I, I've got a Tauran deck that, that goes pretty wide with Drakes. There's not a lot of blue anthems necessarily really there either. And I was like, oh, I finish a lot of turns with like, you know, five or six drakes tapped that I hit somebody with. And that's a decent amount of just chip damage that I'm getting for free for a two mana artifact. Mm. Um, and, and then I, I have a, a deck that does a lot of mana dork stuff. Um, my Eldrazi Spawn and Scion deck, it's a little bit different than Matt's Raga Draga deck that also does a lot of mana dork stuff. And again, it's a situation where like, I'm not attacking with those creatures, I'm utilizing them, but they're going to end their turn tapped What's a two mana card that lets me throw an extra, you know, half a dozen damage every turn at someone's face? That's pretty good. So like sometimes you just have to be in the right situation to realize, the, you know, absolutely Throne of the God Pharaoh is going to be win more in some decks. In some decks, it's just really, really useful. And it depends on the deck and the angle you take. And and so, and you just got to play with a card sometimes too to realize which of those things it is. Yeah, yeah. I think especially an important component about that is that Throne of the God Pharaoh can have that can count as a level of redundancy, which might make it fall into the overkill camp, except that it also technically is a diversified win condition for you in one of those decks too. Mm -hmm. Like if someone is regularly fogging the damage that you're trying to deal, this is still something that can get around that. And that is one of the things that would push it into a much more useful category in in, in my head, at least. Where, but I could totally. You're going to feel really good about throwing the God Pharaoh if you play against an Angus McKenzie deck or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That that kind of thing for sure. Yeah. Um. So I could totally see there are contexts where pff, you don't need it, but there are also some times where it's just like I'm glad I've diversified what this win condition is capable of. Yeah. Um. And and like speaking of this particular like oh equal to the number of tapped creatures that you have, and speaking of cards that we play, I know that Matt is. A really big fan of the card Harvest Season, which I think also could fall into the the win more camp for a whole lot of people. Harvest Season is a three mana green sorcery. Search your library for up to X basic land cards, where X is the number of tapped creatures you control, and you get all those lands into the battlefield tap and then shuffle. So, if you're having a lot of tapped creatures in play, if you're going to get a lot of lands off of this Harvest Season, 
you've already presumably been in a pretty good position and the thing that right. you're getting isn't my opponents are dead faster the thing that you're getting is some more mana right. and i think to a lot of us we'd be kind of like eh, <laughs> like i don't know if i need that but for matt he loves this card and that is like and he should love this card Th this card works well for him cool and there are ways that he's able to manipulate it that i that i'm not able to or that i haven't thought of and like cool that's that's awesome and i, I think that's one of the the primary lessons for me is that like actually win more designs are kind of really awesome <laughs> like they're actually kind of neat they're one of the things that makes you excited to try something out in a game of edh and and to have flourish to the games and i think they add a whole lot of texture to games that is actually really really enjoyable and there are probably times where like we we play them in our own decks even if they're not necessarily helping us get over you know pushing over the edge it's still just kind of neat sometimes to just do it anyway yeah yeah absolutely right uh there's a lot to be said for running the card that might not be the most optimal thing if it's a fun thing to do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, precisely. Well, and that's that's one that Matt plays. And I've I've got one in one of my decks that I I can't make up my mind about. I think <laughs> I don't know. I'll, I'll just I'll just say what the card is, and then I just need to like sort of like piece it out. Um, but like Divine Visitation is something that I use in one of my token decks, and that's the five mana enchantment. If one or more creature tokens would be created under your control, that many four four white angel creature tokens with flying and vigilance are created instead. And that that's actually honestly a card that I've struggled with here and there. I use it in my Thalese deck where I'm making a whole lot of one ones all the time, and turning those one ones into four four flying vigilant angels seems really darn cool. And that really makes it feel like yeah, this should fall pretty directly into this is one of your win condition cards, Joe, because it's pumping up the team and making them much more efficient in combat to take your opponents down. But I have had some moments in that deck where I'm still like yeah but i still need uh, occasionally these angels don't get all the way there and i still feel like i need like one more extra pump to make them actually be lethal sometimes and so i wonder about like is this divine visitation actually redundant or not sometimes in that deck it's not a card i've made up my mind about and it's not a card i'm removing from that deck anytime soon sure. but it is one that like <laughs> sure. I, I i look at it sometimes and it just a little question mark appears above my head and i'm not sure where to put it in my brain sometimes just to go back to the the point of like win more versus win con can still sometimes be tricky even when you know the context <laughs> yeah because i've definitely such seen situations with that card where like the person making enough tokens like it doesn't matter whether or not they're angels or not you're killing somebody with the amount of tokens you just made anyway yeah um like the, it, it 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 is relevant then again there's situations where like because i'm running it in my mono white planeswalker deck and being able to turn those one one soldiers that elspeth makes into three angels is oftentimes a difference between make, being able to kill somebody mm. and also surviving the crack back from somebody else because of the vigilance on the angels uh, yeah. versus not doing so. So um, it, it is one that, that definitely to me feels like a win condition, but I only run it in that one deck where it is. There's probably plenty of situations where it wouldn't be too. Yeah, yeah. These these things get complicated. I don't know. Are there that, like that was one of Matt's decks? That was one of my cards. Like, are, are there cards that you've played where you're just like, hmm, I can't make up my mind about this, but I like playing it anyway. <laughs> you know, one that I I ran into for years was Kindred Summons. Um, it always felt very much win more to me. Like, you know, it's it's seven mana, and you have to have X amount of creatures in play, um, to really make it worthwhile to put those free creatures in play. And like. Okay, let's say you've got, like, to, to make it really impactful, you feel like you want to have quite a few of those bodies in play, um, but how often do you have a bunch of really impactful creatures of the same type in play? You know, if you're playing, I, I mentioned a deck with dragons and green before, if, if you've got half a dozen dragons out where you're going to get a huge kindred summons cast, you're probably already winning. Mm. And if you've got, you know, half a dozen elves out, is seven mana to get a few more elves in play? that amazing it doesn't feel that amazing necessarily <laughs> um but then again I, I found a deck where it was really good so like it, it depends on the situation that was one that i once upon a time would have definitely called win more but in the deck where i'm running it where i have a bunch of eldrazi that make eldrazi spawn and scion tokens that count as eldrazi huh. so it's very easy to like <laughs> just play two creatures or something that each make two tokens and suddenly kindred summons is going to put six more Eldrazi into play, all of which are going to make, you know, two or three more spawn tokens. Um, that's a situation where like that card turned into a win condition versus me always feeling like it was either underwhelming or win more. Oh man. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's also a great example. Like of it turned, 
And, and like, let's be real. I'm pretty sure that you're just like, I just kind of want to play this one anyway. <laughs> but like, you're absolutely right. It, it also feels really fun to do in that deck too. Yeah, but but yeah, it's just like, oh, this is and honestly losing to a bunch of Eldrazi that like plopped out a bunch of even bigger Eldrazi and more. Yeah, like that sounds it's hysterical. It sounds fun to play against as well, which is the real point of using it. But like mm -hmm. that is yeah, taking those cards and transforming them depending on that context. That's oh man, that that's very interesting. And and regardless, I do think that Kindred Summons is just like oh, this is just a really exciting card to play. Any, anyway, um, and and again, that's what I, I sort of mean by like those potentially win more looking cards. Just it's an exciting design space for them to go into, and it kind of guides mm -hmm. you about how do you want to play that type of deck anyway, L like having played that Stencia Masquerade or whatever, I'm just like, oh, this taught me about how vampire decks want to do stuff. They're going to be very, very attacky. So even if I'm not actually going to use this card in the deck, it did actually guide the way that I wanted to build the deck. And I could say the same thing about Kindred Summons. It's just like, oh, I'm playing a whole bunch of elves. Well, you know what the elves might like, or you're playing a whole bunch of Eldrazi. Yeah. Gee, what you know what they might like, that kind of thing. So like, even if there are some of these cards that we decide not to use, they do actually shape the way that we end up building our decks. And I think that that's also a really useful and exciting thing about them as well. Yeah, I, I think just thinking about this is very useful. And I, I, I this is the kind of thing that I didn't probably think about three or four years ago. Um, or for, probably for a couple of reasons. For one, we've just gotten so many cards the last couple of years and they've <laughs> yeah. been focusing on commander as well that like, you know, once upon a time, win more versus win condition, you just needed win conditions. Yeah. Where, whereas they like legitimately print cards with the intent of them being a way to close out a commander game these days. So like there's just a lot more win conditions that make it so you can kind of s categorize those things and take a look at whether or not maybe a card is overkill or unnecessary way that you didn't maybe need to five years ago when you would just take anything that would put you over the top regardless. Because right. um, <laughs> there were so yeah. few options. But the, yeah. but the other reason I, I think about this more now than I once did, I think, is because also the sheer amount of sets that come out mean I make a lot more changes to my decks than I once did. Mm. So I'm, I think I, I try to be way more intentional about what cards I run and I'm, you know, much more critical of which ones I keep in my deck because there's so many things I want to try out or put in my list. And I, so I do a lot more evaluate, okay, is this card really something that's going to be useful to advance my board state and advance my game? Or is it only going to be good when I've already advanced my board state and game to a certain point? So I, right. I, I think that that's something that I think about more and, and, and critically examine more than I once did. And I think it would behoove people to do so for that reason as well, just because like there's just so much stuff that that's the kind of you have to be more critical than you once did, I guess. Yeah. And that's one of the things I examine. No, that's a really great point. And one more for me, like speaking about the number of, you know, the relentless number of new products and cards that we're constantly, constantly getting uh, I, like. Uh, even if you begin to recognize the the win more cards out there, it also it doesn't just matter about like the cards that are, are coming here. Like we also need to recognize that we ourselves can be the indulgent ones because mm -hmm. players absolutely like th this is kind of one of my, my like final lesson for the show too is that like we we as players can take cards that are not win more and turn them into win more situations oh, sure. <laughs> just through the way that we play them like all, all three of us have had landfall decks for example and if matt's popping off with his omnath locus of rage you know what he doesn't need he doesn't need a rampaging baloth doing stuff too because he's already popping off that would be a little bit redundant if he's already doing super super well in that thing so if he sandbagged that card instead that would probably work out a little bit better for him he wouldn't actually need to commit both of those to the board or like if i don't know dana if you're taking over the world with a scoot swarm that keeps doubling and doubling and doubling and doubling it would be a little bit like i don't need to play this avenger of zendikar now do i because that right. would also be a board and again all on its own so what you should do is like probably hold on to it just in case your scoot swarm gets removed mm -hmm. and then like in that event you've got a backup plan but players who overextend can make themselves fall into win more situations even if there are not win more cards in their deck and that is also a really important lesson for us to take home as well yeah that's about the perfect way to wrap that up i i, I completely agree <laughs> uh just in general just examining this stuff closer and closer is going to make you a better brewer and a better builder and a better player and that's that tends to lead to better games yeah yeah uh, the games it will help you win more but you have to avoid win more there we go there we go <laughs>
<laughs> yeah, th this is a really interesting conversation. Again, I think it's really valuable to because, you know, the, the card slots in our deck these days are really, really valuable. So like if you actually mm -hmm. need those card slots to be reserved for, you know, the protective spells or the cards that truly push you over the top, that's an important reason to have this. But it also is just a thing that can help us reflect upon our own play styles and our own deck building strategy. This is a whole lot of fun. And listeners, I'd really like to hear from you about different examples that you've got out there of like, oh, I think these cards are win more. These cards are win conditions and the different contexts that makes those cards come alive or not be all that great at all. This is a, a very interesting thing. So I, I really want to hear from listeners on this one for sure. Yeah, I, I think that's a nice way to kind of put a hat on it, Joey. Um, the hat that the snowman left in my front yard. Um, it's good to be able to reuse uh, that as well. So yeah. <laughs> Oh, goodness. Well, you know what, Dana? I'm just glad that you you said you got coal. I, I think you deserve coal for, for <laughs> the holidays. So, like, that was so silly. All right, you know, we just need to shut this down. We're going to call this episode to a close. Uh, Dana, if our listeners want to get in touch with you, where can they find you online? <laughs> you can find me online at Dana Roach. I'm writing articles for EDA Trek and Commander's Herald. And you can find all of us together at patreon.com slash EDA Trekcast. And I'm Joey Schultz. You can find me on the online spaces at Joseph M. Schultz, and you can find the cast at EDH Retcast on all of those online places too. Plus, if you've got a question for us, you can contact us at EDHRetcast at gmail.com. Our thanks go out once again to Chase for assisting me with the post-production of the show. You can find them online at Mana Curves. And listeners, we'll be back at you next week with more data and insights. But until then, remember, EDH wreck your deck before you wreck your deck. Hey!